So I read Buffalo Dance, um, the York story, and it reminded me of two other works, Wide Sargasso Sea and Faux, both these reimaginings of fictional um, novels. So what I thought was great about your your collection was how you were re-envisioning or giving voice to a historical person that was um, marginalized very much and, and and glossed over. So you you took this person and brought him back to life. And, um, you know, like, I, I mean, I cited a couple examples of similar things, but where did you come up with that idea of, of the actually digging up a historical character and bringing him to page? Well, for me, it, it, the whole thing was born out of uh, embarrassment. Uh, I actually went to a Chautauqua presentation about the, the historical person, York, uh, and the more I heard about his Kentucky connections, the more I struggled with the idea that it was possible that I'd never heard of him. Mm -hmm. uh, and once I realized that what I learned about Lewis and Clark was a very limited version of the story, uh, that it was presented as you know, the heroics of two uh, white supermen uh, and not 42 people mm -hmm. led by you know, two paid uh, military individuals, uh, including a 15-year-old young woman with a three-month-old baby, an African-American manservant. Somehow that had always been left out of the story mm -hmm. when it was taught to be in, in my uh, middle school and high school, whenever it was referenced, but always in a very truncated, very limited way. Uh, and I, I immediately was curious about, you know, how York was, was presented. And so I, I purchased a book called In Search of York that talked about how York was treated uh, throughout literary history uh, versus how he appears in actual journals. Um, I never even knew that you could buy copies of the journals. Um, so I immediately went and, and bought three different abridged versions of journals kept by five different people in the expedition and learned even more about York. Uh, and the more I read, the more astonished I was that uh, I didn't know about him because he had made so many large contributions to the success of the expedition that it seemed impossible that he could have been left out. Uh, it, and then uh, as I finished In Search of York, I found out that he actually was included in some earlier versions of the historical accounts of the expedition, but then uh, simultaneously with uh, post-reconstruction, his contributions were, uh, were not only either left out, in some cases uh, they were reduced to caricatures. Mm -hmm. um, there were accounts in books that you know, described him as a sexual predator. Uh, or a, you know, a, a minstrel, a, a goofball, an idiot, um, as opposed to what the journal said, which which was this man of high character that Native Americans respected so much that they, you know, tried to get him to impregnate young maidens so they could keep some of him in the tribe. Mm -hmm. You know, which that's the grandest compliment. That's different from what these history books were saying. Uh, and then when I considered the speaker and considered what was happening during that time period, it made sense that they would need to do that to be consistent with what else they were doing in the world um, and politically and socially in America. Um, and I, it became important to me to, to find out as much as I could about the expedition, period. Um, and even then I wasn't trying to write a book, I just wanted to know, mm -hmm. um, you know, as, a, as an educator, and as a grandparent, you know, I really want to, I don't want to pass on that ignorance, you know, to another generation. Mm -hmm. But I learned so much that it only made sense to me to start writing it down and to, to try to put it together as, as a narrative uh, that turned into initially one book, then two books, and since then, now three books. And the third book is actually going to be a movie, a feature film. Oh, really? Uh, so it's this story, it's such a compelling American story that uh, it's still brand new to most people, and you know it's. I think it's finally going to get, you know, it's just telling, you know. That's awesome. So I, I knew about the two books, but the the third that you're talking about, that's the the third. I I've already um, 
I haven't signed the contract. I already have met with University Press of Kentucky. They published the first two, you know, Buffalo Dance and When to Come. Uh, it's a book I wrote last year while I was on sabbatical. In fact, a year ago, that's what I was doing on my sabbatical. Uh, in May of last year, I sold it to a, a film company out of Los Angeles. And, and then they actually flew me out to the pre-production uh, activities in, in Idaho, Montana, and Oregon. Oh, that's uh, awesome. In, in July and, and early August. And I uh, had a chance to, you know, to do some additional writing, mm -hmm. uh, to do some, some assigned writing as part of the contract, fulfill my contract. Uh, with them and this summer uh, in July, August in August they start shooting so they'll shoot August through November uh, in those three states so they can get three different seasons mm -hmm. to tell the story um, and I get to, to go back and forth and, and yeah that's really cool yeah um, I've been to uh, I spent a summer working with uh, teenagers on the uh, Blackfeet Reservation ah. in Montana, yeah. near Hart Butte, um, but they're, they have uh, Lewis and Clark, like where they, I uh, can't remember if there was a skirmish or, or whatnot with the Blackfeet there. Yeah, but Everything, uh, the entire park system in Montana is based on Lewis and Clark expedition. Really? Yeah. Oh, it, it kind of follows there. Because um, it cut all the way through, and you know, the Missouri River goes through. Um, and so the whole water system, I think there are like five official stops and celebration points. Uh, you know, the Native American Reservation contact is part of that. Um, you know, Blackfeet figure prominently mm -hmm. in that part of the expedition. Um, so yes, I mean, it's, in fact, one of my 